Genesis 19, I turn to a passage like that, it should go without saying that I'm... There you go. <laughs> I'm not preaching a, uh, a resurrection or an Easter Sunday sermon. You know, I fully intended to, I, I wanted to, and I thought about what I would preach throughout the week, and, um, you know, I, I, I know I'm supposed to, I guess, because it's Easter Sunday, but, um, you know, sometimes I think God lays things in our hearts, and to be perfectly honest, my mind was really preoccupied with the soul winning marathon, more, more so than Easter, and I don't say that in a bad way, it's just kind of what was going on, and, and uh, you know, just kind of the, some of the experiences that I saw, some things, just kind of reflecting on it, it's kind of inspired the sermon. I kind of had a, a rough outline earlier on in the week, and, and then I kind of just throughout the week as I thought about the where we're at as a nation and what we're trying to do, or what we tried, or what did, excuse me, on Saturday, the marathon, just kind of got me thinking about some other things. And, you know, if you're really hurting for, a, for an Easter sermon, a resurrection sermon, I can guarantee you that... You can go online on YouTube and there's going to be like six or more great sermons on the subject that you can go listen to. You know, I preached last Sunday on the death of Christ and, 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 and uh, that's a very important subject. And of course, I don't mean to downplay the resurrection at all. I, I you know, quite honestly, I, I have preached the resurrection uh, from this pulpit in times past, you know, randomly out of nowhere, just not on a specific day. And I'll probably do the same thing again. It's a great topic, but there was just something else I felt like preaching this morning. So you're going to have to get that resurrection sermon from some other source this morning. I will touch on it tonight a little bit, but um, I wanted to preach this this morning. What I'm preaching this morning, the title of the sermon is called Lingering or Laboring in the Last Days. Lingering or Laboring in the Last Days. And I'm, I'm start, we started there in Genesis 19. We're not going to spend a lot of time in Genesis 19. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 18 a little bit more and some other scriptures. But I did want us to read Genesis 19 because Genesis 19 is just a good reminder of, of some of the, the harder truths that are in the Word of God. Right. You know, people often criticize the Bible and say, oh, the Bible was written by men. You can't really trust it. You know, and that's true. The Bible was written by men. The Bible says that holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And that's how we receive the, the Word of God, that, that the Holy Ghost came upon those men and they wrote those things that they were moved to write by God and God has sent His uh, preserve those words for us Amen. and uh, so that's very true but one of the things that always strikes me about that statement about saying well the Bible is just written by men that's there's that's a reason to miss it dismiss it is the fact that yes it was written by men but it doesn't exactly cast man in the best light does it right it does a really good job of telling it like it is when it comes to mankind right I mean we look at Genesis 19 that's a dark chapter I mean we have sodomites in there we got you know people commit trying to commit rape we have incest. I mean, just disgusting, vile sins. Things that we don't want to think about or talk about. Things that we don't like to have our minds dwell on. And certainly not things that we would write about ourselves. Certainly not things that we would want to say, hey, this is what mankind is like. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those you know, important chapters because it helps us understand that there are some hard truths in the Word of God. And one of the hard truths that we understand from Genesis 19 is the fact that God destroys wicked nations. God destroys wicked people. That's right. That God is a God who judges. God is a God who pours out wrath. God is a God who destroys people. Now, if you would, turn back one chapter to Genesis chapter 18. I really I want to look at two individuals this morning. I want to look at the character of Lot, and I want to look at the character of Abraham. Because it's from those two characters that I get that title, because of lingering or laboring in the last days. Because that's kind of what we see happening with these guys. We see Lot lingering, and we see Abraham Laboring. Now, if you look there in Genesis chapter 18, we'll start reading in verse 16. Genesis 18, 16, the Bible reads, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went out to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing Abraham shall surely become a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth uh, shall be blessed in him. For I know that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abram that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. And Abraham uh, stood yet before the Lord, and, and, excuse me. and the men turned their faces uh, from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Verse 23, And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
Free adventure there be fifty within the city. Wilt thou also uh, destroy and spare not the place where the fifty righteous that are with therein? <clears throat> far, uh, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of the earth do right. So we see here that when Abraham learns what it is that God is going to do, that he's come down to go see if the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah be true, that he plans on destroying these people. And, uh, you know, Abraham doesn't try to make excuses. Abraham doesn't try to help God understand that what they're doing isn't that bad, that that's just the way they were born. And what was it? What was the sin? I mean, the sin was sodomy. That's what they were into. Yeah. They were they were a bunch of queers. They were faggots. That's what was going on in that, in that yeah. city. Right. You know, and, and he doesn't try to excuse this. He doesn't try to, you know, placate God. But you know what he, you know what he does stand up for is the righteous. Right. And he starts to whittle God down. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit more. All the way from 50, if we read the rest of the story, we know he says, will thou destroy it, pretty adventure that be found 10 righteous. So he gets him from 50 all the way down to 10. And again, that should help us to understand something, that God destroys wicked nations. Amen. You say, well, I don't know if I like this sermon. I don't know if I agree with this topic. It's Resurrection Sunday. Why are you preaching this? You know, well, this needs to be preached. That's right. And I saw some things yesterday just reminded me, this is the message that this country needs to hear. That's right. Everyone wants to feel good and, and, and go to church today. And there's people that won't ever darken a door any other day besides Easter Sunday. They're going to go to church out of just you know placating some family member. Or should they feel like it's just their duty to go to church. And they just want to hear a nice sermon about how Jesus rose from the dead. And praise God that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. I'm glad for that. But you know what? He's coming back again. Amen. Amen. He's going to come back again and he's going to judge this earth. And there's nothing that I'm going to read to you from the Word of God that can even begin to compare what Jesus is going to do right. when He comes back to this earth the second time and pours out His wrath on this earth. Right. Yeah. And a lot of it's going to be because of some of the same things that we see here in Genesis 19. <clears throat> so first of all, we have to understand that God destroys wicked nations. And you say, well, that's Old Testament. You know, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. Why are you bringing that up? Well, Jude, which is way deep, you know, second book from the from last from the from the in the New Testament. You know, cite Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. It says in Jude 1, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, strange flesh are set forth as an example. We have this story back here in Judges 19 because they are set forth as an example. That's right. God wants us to look back at these chapters and learn something from this. Yep. <laughs> Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You know, God destroys wicked nations. If you would, turn over to Psalm chapter 19. Or Psalm chapter 9. Go to Psalm chapter 9. You're going to Psalm chapter 9. I'm going to read to you from Isaiah chapter 40. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, All nations before Him are as nothing, and they are counted to Him less than nothing. I mean, it's not enough to God just to say they're nothing to me. He says they're less than nothing. Yep. How can you have less? They're in the negative. <laughs> and people don't want to, you know, want to think of this. And don't get me wrong. I, I love the fact that I've been born in the United States of America. There's honestly, as far as I know, there's really no other place I'd rather live. I mean, the conveniences we have, yeah. the quality of life we have. I mean, if you start to if you start to study anything from a, a, you know ancient histories and ancient civilizations that have come through time, you know things that people used to have to endure. You know what it meant to be a you know a citizen in certain countries and civilizations throughout time. We've got it really, really right. good. Right. I mean, we as just even what they would consider poor people live as kings used to. And that's right. not an exaggeration. You know, we enjoy foods and conveniences and thing, and technology like the world has never known before because yep. we're part of this country because we were born here. But let me tell you something. This country is turning its back on God, right. or it has in so many ways turned its back on God, is rejecting God, it's becoming hostile to the things of God, yep. and they need to understand something and don't think just because you wave the red, white, and blue that somehow you're just going to get past. The guy looks down and says, well, America's different. America's just better than everybody else. They can get away with it. You know, God says about America, he says of all nations, that they are less than nothing. Yeah, that's right. You know, when God comes back, he's going to send up, when Jesus comes back, he's going to set up his own kingdom. He's going to fly his own flag. Yeah. He's not going to, he's not going to run for president of the United States. <laughs> he's not going to just try and, you know, be part of the, you know, of, of what we got going on here. He's going to set up a whole new thing. You're there in Psalm chapter 9. Look at verse 17. Psalm chapter 9. In verse 17, the Bible says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. All nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. You know, that's what that's where we're headed. That's where we're going in this country. A nation that is forgetting God. Forgetting our, our roots of our forefathers, forgetting about the God of the Bible, and we're slowly and surely being turned into hell. 
And we, we can talk about that figuratively, and just you know, going to hell in a handbasket, how this court, this country, morally is just declining and going into a gutter. But not only that, because of all the lies and the heresy that's being preached and taught in our public school systems, and the godless culture that we live in, it's literally turning droves of people in this nation, entire nations that are going into hell. Right. Now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but did you notice last night if you watched the live stream? of all the results that were coming in, that there were some places there were soul winners out and nobody got saved. Yeah, right. now, I'm not down on those soul winners. I think that takes a lot of character. I think it takes a lot of determination yeah. to go out and go soul winning in a country that doesn't want to hear it. That's, right. Right. Man, and that's a whole nation. There was one person saved in Japan yesterday. Right. Maybe yeah. it was zero. People went out. There's countries that nobody got saved. Yeah. Can you imagine just think, I remember hearing that and thinking, imagine the fact that there are countries in this world where they go days without anybody accepting Jesus Christ. That happens. All nations, nations get turned into hell. Entire people go to hell. Yep. Entire populations. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Well, that's not a very nice prayer, David. That's what he prayed. That's what he wanted to see. To see the, the heathen judged. Put them in fear, O Lord. Why? That the nations may know themselves to be but men. Amen. Why preach a sermon like this? So that people will get humble, so people understand that they need to see unto their God. Yeah. So that people understand that they're nothing special, that, that they are they are just men before God, that they're part of a country that God hearts as less than nothing. That's why we need to understand this. It says there are all nations, no exceptions. Not the United States, not Israel, not anybody. There are no exceptions. Right. If you forget God as a nation, you're bound for hell. <clears throat> now he says there, let the heathen be judged. You know, and amen to that. And that's a real easy attitude to adopt. And it's getting easier all the time. The more wickedness we see coming, the more just filth and abomination I see every day in front of my own eyes, in our culture, and our, you know, if you follow the media and the policies that are being enacted in this country, you know, it's real easy to just say, you know what, let the heathen be judged. Yeah. Right. Even so, come Lord Jesus and judge these people. Yeah. And it's a really easy attitude to adopt. And I'm not saying it's a wrong one to have. It says that, uh, you know, they, they, uh, why is it? Because they forget God. We're living in a nation that forgets God. They're forgetting God. And that's an attitude our nation has quickly embraced, isn't it? Yeah. One that just wants to forget God. You know, and that's evidenced by the fact that we see the rise and acceptance of the LGBTQ HIV community. Yeah. You see the, you know, the, the homosexuals, the queers, whatever you want to call them, the transgenders. My day, when I was growing up, we called them transvestites. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they are. Right. The people who want to go you know, mutilate their bodies and not identify as the gender they were born with. It's a bunch of garbage. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And people are uh, accepting it. It's popular. It's accepted. And, be, and if you speak out against it, you're labeled a hate group. Yeah. You're labeled a hate preacher. You label me whatever you want. That's what the book says. And that's what the book calls it. That's Amen. what it is. Yeah. You right. can label it however you want. Go ahead and put me on your stupid list of hate preachers. Amen. And make sure you send me a plaque so I can hang it up with the front of Amen. Because I'm not afraid of being put on a list. I mean, is that the, where we're at in this country? Yeah. You're afraid to be put on a list? <laughs> oh, they're going to put me on the list. <laughs> you know, you're going to send you a memo. You're going to give me a paper cut. <laughs> Go ahead. Mark it up. Yeah. Put me on. I, I, I hate them with a perfect hatred. Amen. Amen. They're That's filthy. Right. They're That's vile. Right. They're abominable. They're not of God. That's right. They, and, and it's it's an attitude that comes of from forgetting God, rejecting God. I mean, that's what Romans 1 describes them as doing. It says in Romans 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's where it all starts. They don't want to think about God. They don't want God to exist. They want to put God out of their mind. And God says, okay, well, I'll forget about you too. Yep. It says that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, a rejected mind. Yeah. To do those things which are not convenient. You know why do they do all those things? Because God has rejected them. God has given them over to a reprobate mind. See, well, that's not very nice. But let's not forget who forgot who first. Right. They forgot God. Yep. They said, I don't want to retain God in my knowledge. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the Christians say. And that's why we're going around and knocking on doors of people who are coming more consistently hostile to the right. gospel, yeah. towards anyone. True. I almost got ran over the other day because right. I'm carrying a Bible in my hand. That's in someone's driveway. I'm trying to cross in front of their driveway. The lady honks her horn and pulls five feet in front of me. Looking. You think it's just because of the look on my face? You know, maybe. I don't know. I, I tend to think it's because I had a Bible in my hand. I had a suit and a tie on. And it was obvious what I was doing. Right. Going out knocking on doors. Oh, there's one of those religious people. Let's see how rude I can treat them. And you know what? That's not going to stop me. All, and all it is is a testimony of where we're at as a country. And we're just seeing people get more and more wicked. Why? Because they're forgetting God. 
we see it with the rise of this LGBTQ community. You know, there are people, we see today in our country that people who do not want to retain God in their knowledge, they want to reject the things of God, they are now a protected class. They are a protected class. They have you know, public policy on their side, they have lawmakers on their side, they can, you know, they, they are protected, and they're a minority. They're the vast majority. And you know, a lot of people in this country still think they're weird. Yeah. Still think they're filthy. Right. Still think they're disgusting. Yeah. They're just too afraid to say it. Right. Why? Because they're a protected class. Yeah. And saying things like that could get you in hot water with them. And they'll go after you. And they and they and they don't stop. You know, they're militant in what they believe. It's true. <clears throat> and I think it's time God's people got a little militant too. Yeah. yeah. At least in a pulpit. At least a man of God, you know, should get some hair on his legs and stand up and not be afraid to preach this every now and then. That's right. To remind people where we're at. Because I'm telling you something, people are, they're not paying attention anymore. I mean, why, why is it they're able to just rise up and do the things that they're doing, this, this community, you know, these, these filthy sodomites? It's because people are at home doing this. Just flipping through the channels. And they're letting this crap be poured into their head. Yeah. And just drown, they're just drowning their minds in the world's philosophy and the world's policies. And, and it takes everyone out and a man of God just needs to stand up and just shame people and remind them what God thinks about these Amen. things. Amen. Right. <clears throat> so... You know, things, things are not as bad as Sodom yet, though they will be. I mean, I've seen some things, at least recently, in the last few years, going on in our culture. I mean, remember Bruce Jenner? And when that all went out, that freak right. goes out and mutilates himself and gets just national attention. He's just getting interviews. His, his image is just as dressed up as a woman with a mutilated body. Is just being promoted and just published all across this country. Healthy. People are having to see that. You know, we're getting bad. Are we as bad as Sodom? No. We're, you know, they're not surrounding houses and, and trying to violate people yet. But I believe there will be a time when it gets about that bad. You say, I don't know. Well, the Bible says evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. At least, at least we can all admit that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. yeah. Before Jesus comes, it's going to get a whole lot worse. <laughs> And we should have the same attitude as one of these two individuals in the story. Abraham or Lot. Because remember the title of the sermon is lingering or laboring in the last days. We should have the same attitude as Abraham. And what was Abraham's desire? I mean, obviously Sodom was Sodom. And, and God was perfectly righteous and just to go and judge those people and destroy those people. But Abraham had an attitude. He wasn't, it wasn't all just, yeah, let God destroy him. I'm sure he didn't, wasn't opposed to that. But what was his heart? It was for the righteous. His heart was for the righteous. We should desire mercy for the righteous. That should be our attitude. I'm saying, you know, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Amen. Even so, go, so come Lord Jesus. Jesus, we should have that attitude. Yeah. But let's not forget on the other side that we should still have mercy and compassion for the righteous. Amen. Not just the righteous that we already know, but the righteous that we can go out and win. That's right. You know, the sinners that are out there that are not, you know, reprobate, which are many of them, you know, there's not, reprobates are every around every corner. You know, vast majority of people are, are not reprobates. They might have a bad attitude. They might reject the things of God. But there are still people out there that'll listen. Maybe it's not 50. Maybe it's not 40. Maybe not it's 30. But hey, what if it's 10? What if there's 10? Is it not worth to have a little bit of compassion on them to go out and at least reach 10 yeah, in a wicked country? Yeah. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know, we should still desire that. We should still desire to pray and be able to just quietly go about our lives winning souls to Christ. Amen. We should still have mercy as, as Abraham did. We should desire mercy for the righteous. And why is that? Not just for their sake, but for our own, own ours only, our, as well. You know, if we, if we want to have a quiet and peaceful life where we can raise our family and all godliness and honesty, and raise some godly children. You know, I look forward to being a grandparent. I'm taking my time getting there. You know, I'm not in a rush. You know, I'm putting off getting old as long as I can. But I think about that, about my kids growing up one day and, and having grandchildren and, and being able to see my, my, my son's sons. I think that's a great thing. Amen. You know, but what if that doesn't happen? What if things get so bad? It's just, it's, we don't see it happen. What if our days are cut short before that? You know, but, but, and then so be it. But in the, there's nothing wrong with wanting that. And if we want that, we're going to have to work for it. And Amen. I think that if we go out and do the works of God, that God will spare our country maybe a little bit. Maybe he'll put off his wrath a little bit longer. I mean, isn't that exactly what, what, what Abraham wanted? He said, well, he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, yeah, they didn't find ten. 
Yeah, go count. Yeah. The ten weren't there. That's how bad it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we could find ten today. I think we could find fifty. We could probably find. I mean, go look at the results. We could find a lot more people that'll, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be made righteous through Christ. See, God will spare a wicked nation if there be some righteous found there. And we need to try and get some righteous people in this country before it is too late. That's right. So that we can have a, a live a quiet and peaceable life. You know, there's another reason why soul winning is so important. It's not, you know, of course the primary reason is to pull people out of hell. I mean, whatever happens to our country and whatever happens in our lifetime, you know, <coughs> is, it pales in comparison to a, somebody spending eternity in a place as terrible as hell. Yeah. And that's our primary motivation. But, you know, another reason why go, to go soul winning is to create a righteous remedy. You know, so we don't, you know, if, if people accept Jesus Christ as Savior, if they get saved, you know, they're not going to become reprobates. They're going to have the Spirit of God in them. They're going to understand truth when they hear it. They're going to understand uh, wickedness when they see it. <clears throat> the Bible says in James 5, Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death, that's important, and shall hide a multitude of sins. You know, if we could get some people saved, maybe God will be a little, will, will be a little more willing to just kind of look over some things. Say, so, you know, I'm going to spare the United States a little bit longer. I'm going to put up. Don't get me wrong; it's coming. Right. This country's far too far gone. It's right. too far gone. Yeah. There's too much innocent blood that's been shed. Yeah. Right. Judgment will come, but may it not come in our days. If maybe we can go out and spare some people, if we can go out and get a righteous remnant made, how are we going to do that? Through soul winning, going Amen. out and seeing people get saved. That's how important soul winning is. You know, we can sound like we're just, you know, beating the same old drum and just repeating the same old message, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Let me say it again, soul winning, soul winning, soul winning. Man. That's what we're about. Because this is how important it is. It can save a soul from hell. It can hide a multitude of sins. And if we can create a righteous remnant, it can, spare, it can put off God's wrath a little longer. And we can see even more works done for God. You see, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked people. And they, whether they knew it or not, they were in the last days of their existence. Yeah. I mean, they didn't know that the Lord was just over the hill. Oh. And He was sending His angels over. And they, and they went right marrying and giving a marriage, drinking, carrying on, and living life like it, it was just another day at the office. Until one day, God shows up and fight, you know, the, the sun came up and fire and brimstone came down. Yeah. Okay. And they were in the last day of their, of their existence, and it just very well may be that's we're about where we're at as a country and as a world. Our nation, no doubt, is heading in the same direction. You can't deny that. Maybe we're not as bad as Sodom, but you can't deny the fact that we're heading in that direction. Right. That's why we go out door knocking yesterday. You know, you got one brother knocking on some tranny's door. Some guy that wants to identify as a woman, or vice versa. Yep. That's why I got to go down the street. And see some fag walking down the street. Yes, I said fag. That's what he is. Right. I'm not afraid of that word. Right. Right. Fag is something that's going to be bound up and burned. Yeah. Right. That's mm -hmm. exactly what God's going to do to these sodomites. Yep. Yep. He's going to gather them, bind them, and burn them. Amen. Mark it down. Yep. i got to walk down the street and watch some guy with his pants hiked up and his little fanny pack, his hair in his ponytail, and his little tiny steps. <laughs> kind of as much like a woman as he can yep. with a mustache on. Right. Oh, wow. It was everything I could not just to roll down the window as I drove by and say, go to hell, you faggot. Right, yeah. And I almost feel guilty for not doing it. Amen. Because we need some people to stand up and call out the filth. Amen. Why do you think they're out and proud? Why do you think he's not afraid to just walk up and down the street looking yeah. like that? Right. Why do you think i got to go door knocking out now, Tukey? Knock on a door, my partner knocks on the door, a man comes out in a sundress with hair down to here, implants, and an Adam's apple out to here and sh shoulders broader than my own. <laughs> Hairy knuckles. <laughs> Why do I got to see that? Why do I got to work somewhere? Why do I got to go to work several times and have to deal with some tranny? Some filthy sodomite. That's what they are. That's right. Because people aren't getting up and calling it out. That's right. Amen. Well, not here. You know, if it bothers you, don't let the door hit you with the good Lord split you. Amen. <laughs> because I'm, I'm sick of it. Yeah, man. You know, and I, I, I fear for my children what they're going to have to see. Right. We didn't, I didn't see this stuff, you know, 10, 20 years ago. This is, we're, we're going down this path so fast, it's, uh, it's breakneck speeds. It's yeah. unbelievable how quickly things are progressing. That's true. I mean, I remember the, in the, the big deal back when I was a teenager was that Ellen DeGenerate was a header show. You know, not the one she has now, her yeah. sitcom. Ellen DeGenerate. Yeah. Right. Her sitcom. <laughs> And, you know, she came out as a lesbian. They pulled the plug on her show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Going? Remember, who remembers Saturday Night Live? It's, it's Pat. 
Yeah. Yeah. Remember it's Pat? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> the whole premise was they couldn't figure out if it was a man or a woman. Yeah. It was some androgynous character and that was the big dad. I gotta use the bathroom. It's over there, Pat. They're trying to see which one it goes into. Imagine running that skit today. Right, right. They pull that For show yeah, right off. Right. Right. Yeah. They don't have the guts to run a skit like that today. But when I grew up, that was funny. We made fun of people like that. Yeah, right? yeah. I'm not that old. <laughs> you know, like I said, right. But I'm not that old. <clears throat> I just keep telling myself that. <clears throat> and the point I'm trying to make is that's how quickly we've progressed in just a few short years, yep. a few decades. Now they're just walking up and down the street. Yep. They're just they'll come answer the door. When we had a brother, Fabian goes and knocks on the door. I was that what they said? I, I don't identify as a woman or something like that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> but people say that now. I, I, I don't I don't identify. Hi ma'am, I'm from a Baptist church. I don't identify as a woman. Yeah. Well I identify as a woman. You can yeah. identify whatever it is. Some of you we have a hard time identifying you too. So, God knows, God knows what they are. <laughs> so our nation, I mean, it's heading in the same direction, yeah. no doubt about it. That's why I had to see that fag walk up and down the street yesterday with this, let me just say it, with this University of Arizona shirt on. Right. That wow. big fat A. And right. you better believe there's a sermon coming about that university. Amen. Amen. When a nation, when a university wants to go on their website and say we're the leading uh, university for transgender studies, you better believe there's a sermon coming. Right. Thinking about yeah. it. That big fat A on his shirt just stands for abomination. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what that university is teaching these people, and universities all across this country, that there's nothing wrong with these people. There's everything wrong with these that's people. Right. And it's an indicator of where we are as a nation. A nation that is going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, it's true. So we need to be like Abraham, so we can try and put off the judgment of God that is sure to come. We certainly don't want to be like Lot in their story, right? Because Lot was the one that was lingering, wasn't he? It says there in Genesis 19, if you're still there, Genesis 19, and there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. I mean, he's cozied right up. He's sitting right in the gate. I mean, the gate's like the public square where you go to meet and talk and greet people and talk business and get to know your neighbor. You know, they didn't have social media back then. It wasn't all done through email. They actually had to go outdoors and talk to people in the marketplace. And that's where Lot was, just rubbing elbows. Look, the Bible says that men from every, every man from every quarter, young and old, came in Sodom came to, to violate those two angels. Yeah. That, I mean, Lot knew exactly who he was dealing with. Wow. And there he is, just hanging out. Lot sat in the gate, and his lazy boy, just flipping through the channels, just, you know, Ellen DeGenerate. Who else is out there? Will and Grace. <laughs> Who are the other people? You know, queer Eye for the Straight Guy. <laughs> what are some other ones? Come on. What are they? What are the other fag shows that are on TV now? Everybody I'm, I'm, I'm glad you guys don't know. <laughs> the ones I just quoted are, I don't know how old. <laughs> They're old though. But you're going to tell me, I mean, they got gay Disney characters. They're trying. There's all kinds of yeah. filth out there. Yeah. Right. Brainwash people from a young age. Yeah. So that's Lot. You know, that's where a lot of people are today. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible says that Lot was a right, that he was a just man. The Bible says, you know, he's in Hebrews 11. He's in the hall of faith that he was saved. Let me tell you something. You can be saved, and you can go rub elbows with these people, and you can get complacent, and you can get brainwashed, and you can be yeah. just okie-dokie with everything that's going on. Yeah. And just become a lukewarm, lame Christian. You can go and be like Lot. And you can vex your righteous soul with the filthy conversation of the wicked every day of your life. And that's where a lot of people are. And they get so vexed by everything they say going on, but they just become numb. And they say, well, what's the point in fighting? They just throw up their hands. They just want to go along with the flow. And that's where Lot is, just lingering. They say, well, maybe it wasn't Lot's fault. Let's not forget that Lot chose to be there. Yeah, right. Go back right. to Genesis 13 if you want. Read it sometime. Lot says, in fact, go there right now. Let's go right there. Go to Genesis chapter 13. Lot chose to be in Sodom. He wanted to be there. And that's where a lot of Christians are today. They're content to dwell with the wicked and to say, well, everything's fine. You know, that's just their lifestyle. We just got to love them to the Lord. Got to love people that hate God. The Bible says they hate God. Yeah. That God gives them over to reprobate mind, but somehow you're better than God, and we're going to win them to the Lord, even though they've been rejected by God. It's not going to happen. Right. 
Genesis chapter 13, look at verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plains of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Sodom and Gomorrah already there. Even as the garden of the Lord. You know these fags, they always love the nicest places. You ever go to the most scenic, the most nice places to live? That's why they're all in Portland. Yeah. That's why they're all in San Francisco. Yeah. That's why they're all where I'm from, Traverse City, Michigan. Because it's a very beautiful place to live. Lots of water, lots of scenery. It's very scenic. It's a very desirable place. Southern California, yeah. Miami, Orlando. They seek out these places. And they go and live there because they're well watered. Because they look nice. They're fruitful. You know, because they, they know in the back of their minds that this life is the best they're ever. Right, yeah, yeah. They know what's coming. Yeah. Um, and it says there that uh, in verse 12, Then Lot chose all, him all the plain of Jordan. He wanted to go there. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. He wanted to wake up in the morning, open up that door, and the first thing he wanted to see was Sodom. That wicked, vile, filthy city. That probably had a lot of merchandise. That was probably really well off. That probably had, you know, you go there and make a lot of money. That's what he wanted. He wanted to go there. Where do we find him? First he starts out in the tent. Just pitch his tent. You know, you're just, you're just there, just watching a little bit of some sodomite friendly show. You know, just once in a while, once a week. Next thing you know, you know, you're 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 talking to your, your gay friend at work and saying, oh, it's just a lifestyle. And you're slowly getting desensitized to it to the point where you're sitting in the gate with them. Yeah. That's what happens when you linger in the last days. You end up like Lot. <clears throat> you know, Lot beholds the well-watered plains, and it's the same problem with Christians today. We've just become so accustomed to the abundance, the well-watered plains of America, just all the conveniences that we have. And I'm grateful for them, but you know, we, we put we think that's more important. We want to hang on to that more than anything. We don't want to rock the boat. We want to keep our nice cush position and not, not say anything offensive. You know, we don't want it to cost us anything to have to be a Christian and so that we can have all these nice things that we're afforded us living in. And that's exactly what brought Sodom and Gomorrah down or led to what brought them down. I'll read to you in Ezekiel 16 where it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of their sister Sodom. Right. Pride, fullness of bread, and right. abundance of idleness. Right. Does that not perfectly describe the United States? Yep. That's right. I mean, fullness of bread. Yep. I mean, we we're gonna go, we're Baptists, and we're gonna get something to eat later. <laughs> but you know what? We're not gonna want. We're, our big problem this afternoon is gonna figure out where are we gonna go. Right. Is it gonna be EG's? Is it gonna be the diner? Is it gonna be Chipotle? Is it gonna be this place? Is it gonna be that place? Where are we gonna go today? You know, that's the big problem. Why? Because we have fullness of bread. Right. Because there's food on every corner, and the abundance of idleness. That's another one. Yep. We want our forty-hour work week. We want our two weeks paid vacation. We want seventeen paid holidays if you work for the city of Phoenix. 17 paid holidays. Right. Wow. Plus vacation. I've never seen a group of people work so hard at not working. Right. And I work at the city. And that's where we're at as a country, as a nation, and as a people. The same place Sodom was. And it says, and in her and was in her and in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty. Godless America. While we just do all the filthiest, vilest things that God absolutely detests. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we think we just get away with it because we're married. Because we're haughty. And they committed abomination before me. That's and the people, and then there's people that'll say, well, that's not why God destroyed, you know, there's hope for the Sodomites because God destroyed Sodom, not because of the, the of the sin that they were into, but because they were they were proud and lazy. No, it says there in verse 50, genius, it says, and they were haughty and committed abomination. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's committing sin. You know, being the gluttonous, lazy individual, that's a sin. Then there's being an abomination. Right. That's a whole other level of, of God abhorring something, right. hating it, despising it. You know, and that's where we're at today. Is we have we're living in a country that's fast approaching its last days, and we have Christians who are just lingering, like Lot. Lingering. They're too full and they're too idle to go work for God. They don't want to work for God. You know, even after, I mean, think about what happened here. Even after hearing the message of doom and destruction from God's own angels, the angels come in, they get Lot, and they say, if you have here in the city, get out, because we're going to rain down fire and brimstone. He says, he says it's going to go down. We're burning this place to the ground. Lot still lingers. You ever notice that? Yep. <clears throat> that they had to actually physically remove Lot from the city? 
Yeah, yeah no, obviously he understood that these were the angels of the Lord. And he knew exactly that they, they said everything that they were going to do. They were going to do everything they said. But if you're still in Genesis 19, where we started this morning, Genesis 19, verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here. So that wasn't ten, was it? <clears throat> Lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold on his hands. And upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. So even in the face of destruction, Lot just continues to linger. Can't let it go. Doesn't want to give up the world. Doesn't want to give up his comfortable little lifestyle in Sodom. And that's where a lot of Christians are today. That's why they get offended when a preacher gets up and calls them fags, and sodomites, and queers, and reprobate, and rejected, and hated of God. Because they don't like it when the, 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 rope get, uh, the, the boat gets rocked a little bit. Yeah. And then and they're like locked. They want to linger. They want to just, maybe I'll go on for a few more years. Maybe things aren't as bad as they look. Look, things are bad. Amen. And things are going to get worse in this country. Yeah. Our country is going down in flames. Yeah. You know, with, with inflamers. Right? <laughs> inflamers are just bringing us down. And Christians, they're just content to ride it out as if nothing's wrong. It's true. Their contention just go on with the flow, not rock the boat, nothing's wrong, just you know, hear no evil, see no evil, right, see no evil. Yeah. head in the sand, yeah. don't want to admit what's going on, don't like it when anyone points it out, and they want to just go wrong with the, with the flow. They're like Lot, they're just lingering. You say, how do you, what, what's your proof? I'll tell you my proof right here. It's right here in this bulletin. Right here in his results. Don't get me wrong about what I'm about to say. I, I love so many big marathons. I'm looking forward to next year. I am thankful for the 2,441 souls that got saved. Amen. Yesterday. Praise God for that. That's right. Word of God that we're every day in this, right. in this world. Right. But you know what's really sad? And I'm not down on the 2,000 people, 2,258 soul winners. I'm, pr I'm glad. I'm proud of every single one of them. I'm glad we got every single one of them. But there's 7 billion people yeah, in this world. Yeah, for real. That's there's right. 7 billion people in this world and there's less than 3,000 people that, and I'm sure there's other people that went out soul winning other people that would have gone if they could have or had something going on or like you know whatever that go soul winning at other times and not down on you if you didn't make it yesterday whatever but I'm trying to make the point here that even if we had every man woman boy girl everybody that could go soul winning out yesterday do you think it would really be a whole lot more than 3,000 people no in a world of 7 billion people right our country, our world is going to hell fast. And, and Christians today just ride it out. You think there's more than 3,000 Christians in the world? Yeah. You think there's 3,000 more people in this more than 3,000 people in this world that understand what it takes to get saved? Yeah. That if they wanted to, could have gone out and gotten soul saved? And you know what? You say, well, that's just one day. Let me tell you something. There's Christians that go their whole life without winning a single right. soul price. Yeah. They can't be bothered with it. Because they're too busy lingering in the gate at Sodom, yeah. taking in everything that Sodom has to offer, you know. and not wanting, and, you know, just, just lifestyle evangelism. <laughs> you know, I heard it. I heard someone, a preacher, say real recently. I like this. I'm all for lifestyle evangelism. Evangelism. My lifestyle is evangelizing. Amen. You know, that ought to be your lifestyle right. evangelism. Make Amen. evangelism your lifestyle. Right. Amen. And I, would to God that we had more Christians. That that number grows. I hope that number. It, it just is a lot more than it is next year. We need more soul winners. Yeah. See, we need more people who are going to be like Abraham. If you would go back to uh, Genesis chapter 18. Abraham is not like Lot. Abraham, we find, busy serving God. That's what he's doing. Sodom and Gomorrah on the brink of destruction. What's Abraham doing? He's serving God. Look at 18 verse, uh, Genesis 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and said, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes, and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent of the door. He didn't wait for them to come to him. He knew it was the Lord. It was the heat of the day. He didn't say, well, I'll just see. <coughs> see if the Lord has something to say. He's, he's headed this way. <laughs> He'll make it here eventually. When he saw God moving, when he saw God showing up, when he saw the presence of God, he wanted to be there. He didn't care how hot it was. He got up, 
off his backside and ran to meet him from the end of the day. Yep. And he bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your, soul, your hearts. After that you shall pass on. For therefore you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah. He hastened. He wasn't idle. He wasn't lingering. He wasn't taking his time. He ran. He hastened. It said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, needed to make cakes upon the earth, on the hearth. <clears throat> and Abraham ran unto the herd. I mean, this guy's running everywhere. Right. In the heat of the day, he's busy serving God. He's trying to get a meal together to God. He wants God to stay with him. He got, wants God to bless him. He wants to know what God has to say. He wants God to be pleased with him. What's he do? Serves him. And he does it with haste. Yeah. He ran out of the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, he had, and, and he hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed. I mean, he is a Baptist. <laughs> you know, our roots go deeper. Right? Right. <laughs> you know, we got we got a meal getting served up. That sounds good. Right. Why don't you got, we go get some butter, milk, and some calves, right? Yeah. And he dressed and he set it before them. <coughs> he set it down. And he stood by under the tree and they did eat. And he was busy to serve God. That's the type of person we want to be today. Amen. That's the type of Christians we need today. If we're ever going to see that number of soul winners grow. It's going to be because we had some. Christians who aren't afraid to stand up in the heat of the day when it's hard, when it's not easy, and are still going to go out and serve God. Was it easy yesterday going out soul for five hours? No. It was probably not as hard as it could be. You know, at least we got a lot of people saved. Amen. At least we saw 36 souls come to Christ yesterday. Amen. We know what it took. It took going out in the heat of the day. Yeah. It's not even hot here yet, and it was hot. <laughs> and it's only going to get hotter in the next few months. Are we going to quit soul winning because it gets hot? No. We're going to keep going out. We're going to keep doing the work. It wasn't the easiest thing. I mean, good night. My, the, where I was, my team, you know, we might have saw one person come to the Lord, I think. I mean, look at them. We covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Several blocks. Knocked a lot of doors. People slamming doors. Not coming to doors. Not interested. It's not always easy. But you know what? We still got to serve. We still got to do it. We still got to go out and do the work. While we're out there soaking up all the bad doors, I mean, what if I had sent Fabian over there? <laughs> what if I had said, said, no, Fabian, no apartments for you? And sent him over to that unreceptive neighborhood. You know, but we were we were there busy soaking up the bad doors, so Fabian can go get the good doors. Amen. Amen. And those that were with him. And that's how you got to look at it. You know, you're not going to win souls every single time you go out door knocking. I didn't get one yesterday. But I'm still rejoicing in the fact that, you know, 36, you know, Somebody got 36 other souls saved today. Amen. It doesn't have to be me every time that does it. We're a team here. Right. And we need people to go out and serve God. Be like Abraham. They need to be quick to serve the Lord. Not worry about the temperature or what it's going to cost them. Oh, my best calf, tender and good? No, not for God. Get them that old wiry, bony calf, that old cow, that old, you know, that's just been nothing but a nuisance. She's on her, you know, last leg anyway. You know, and just give that to God. A lot of people are like that. Uh -huh. Oh, we'll just give God a little bit here and there. Abraham was quick. He didn't let the circumstances, he didn't let the heat of the day get to him. And he went out and had fun. The best that he had, and that's what he gave to God. Yeah. And that's what we need today. We need to be like Abraham, not like Lot. We need to labor. Don't linger. Destruction's coming. Wrath is coming. Judgment's coming. Don't be like Lot and linger in the gates of Sodom. Be like Abraham in Genesis 18 and be quick to serve God. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You go to 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always. All the time. You should be abounding more and more in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. I mean, was Lot's labor in vain? No. He had a conversation with God. He was able to influence the mind of God Almighty. Because he labored. Because he entreated the Lord. Because he gave and he worked. And he was able to talk God down from destroying a country, from destroying that city from 50 to 10. That's, you know, God agreed, 10. But the 10 weren't there. Yeah, right. But did he not, was he not able to influence the mind of God? Yeah. Wouldn't we want that for our lives, for us to be able to go to God and be able to say, God, can you help me here? God, do this. God, do that. And have God actually go, you know what? I will do that. Would he have done that for Lot? I think Lot's lucky he got out of there alive. Right, yeah. The Bible says the only reason he got out is because God was merciful <laughs> unto him. Meaning he didn't. Mercy is getting 
Not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is getting what you do, not getting what you do deserve. I mean, he said he was merciful in it. I mean, God was very patient with Lot. And said, you know what? I, I agreed to spare it for ten. I tell you what, I'm just going to spare these few people here, and the rest are going to go. He didn't have to do that. He could have destroyed the whole city and been perfectly just in doing it. He agreed with Abraham for ten. Well, that's what we want. We want God to be, you know, to listen to us and hear us. <clears throat> and if we labor for God, you know, we're going to be fruitful. I mean, it's the same thing with, with Abraham here. He was fruitful. If you think about it, he, he was able to stand on the promises of God. He was faithful to God. And God's promises came true for him. That he became very fruitful. Uh, go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. Keep something in Genesis. If you're not there, never mind. Just go to Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. The Bible says, all right, add you in 2 Corinthians. If you're going to Hebrews 6, I'll read 2 Corinthians. The Bible says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. And that's a big reason to labor for God right there, that he'd accept you, that he'd approve of you, that he'd look down and say, I'm pleased with you. There's a reason to labor. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 6 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, and that he minister to the saints and do minister. God pays attention to what we do. God pays attention to whether or not we're lingering. God pays attention to whether or not we're laboring. He pays attention. And we know that our labor, our, if we're going to be fruitful, if we work for God, that we're going to bear fruit, as Abraham did. And that that fruit that we bear today, I mean, Abraham, with Abraham, it was a literal child in his old age. God made a promise to him and said, I'm going to make this come true for you, Abraham. You just have to trust me and know that I'm, I'm telling you the truth. And Abraham served him. But Abraham didn't see that promise come to fruition until very much later in his life. And when it came to the promise of his, of his son. And it's true with us. you know. It's not the same with us. We're not looking and praying for... I mean, often sometimes a couple has to pray for a child. But, you know, by and large, what I want to apply this to is the fact that we as God's people need to work for God and stand upon the promise of God that if we work for Him, we're going to be spiritually fruitful. Yeah. We're going to bring forth spiritual seed. And, I mean, that's what the Bible says in Proverbs 11, that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Right. And he that winneth souls is wise. You know, if, we're, if we go out and win another soul to Christ, that's another tree of life. That's another person that can go out and win another soul to Amen. Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so, you know, the conclusion here is that Abraham labored. You know, he was the one that labored. That's what we want to do. And he labored because he knew the promises of God are true. That he understood that judgment is a thing and that God judges and that God rewards. And if you would, keep something in Hebrews 6. But go over to Hebrews or go over to Genesis 17. Stay in Hebrews 6, keep something there, go to Genesis 17. You know, God made a promise to Abraham. <clears throat> it says in Genesis 17, verse 1, and when Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thy seed, and will multiply thee exceedingly. I mean, he's 99 years old, and God said, I'm going, to make, I'm going to multiply you exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram, but thou shalt be called Abraham. For a father of, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land where thou art a stranger, all, of, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I mean, Abraham's there, he's found laboring, and God gives him this great promise. Now, did Abraham see this come true? He didn't. He died. But many hundreds of years later, like many hundreds of you later, and I'm not going to take the time to read it, but if you go to Joshua chapter 11, you see where Joshua comes to the promised land. And in verse 9, he defeats king after king after king after king. Joshua, and Joshua 11 verse 9, he says that the king of Jericho won, the king of Ai, which is beside Bethel, won. The king of Jerusalem won, the king of Hebron won, the king of Jarmuth won. The king of Lachish won, the king of Eglon won, the king of Gezer won, the king of Deber won, the king of Geter won, the king of Horma won. The king of Arad, the king of Libna, the king of Ephraim, the king of Makeda, the king of Bethel, the king of Tapua, the king of Hefer, the king of Aphek, the king of Shimron, the king of Lashron, the king of Aksaph, 
the king of Tanakh, the king of Megiddo. And he goes in and he fulfills this promise that was made to Abraham hundreds of years later. He goes in and just defeats and he takes all of the land of Canaan for his possession. You know, some people would go to Joshua 11 and they would read that and they would say, that's just a list of really hard to pronounce names. <laughs> that's, you know, why would God put that list in there? You no, know, I think I read that and I see a promise that God gave his servant upheld hundreds of years later. Man. You know, maybe that's why so many people linger. Maybe that's why so many people are idle today. Because the promise is too slow to come. To they know Jesus is coming. They know that he's going to reign one day. But to them, it's, it's a far off. They're blind. They can't see it. They lack the faith to see it far off. Yeah. Abraham, do you think Abraham was really expecting that to all happen in his lifetime? God promised him that in Genesis 17. No, he understood that he was 99 years old, that he was going to die, and that this promise was to the nations that would come out of him. And he believed God. <clears throat> and that's why a lot of people today, they don't labor. They're not like Abraham. They're like Lot. They linger. Because they don't really... They, they might even believe the promise of God, but to them it's so far off. You know, we're going to be rewarded for our works that we do in this life, that God is going to reward us for the souls that we win to Christ. Yep. And let me tell you something, that reward is not far off. In fact, it's one breath away. Yeah. Huh. You walk out, you go pull out of here, get a wreck, and you die, and you go straight to heaven, that reward's going to come or not come pretty quick. All right. And we'll, our problem, we're, we're so short-sighted in this life that we don't want to, and we don't want to be bothered with serving God because to us it just seems like it's so far away. And you see, if you're there, go over to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll wrap it up in Hebrews chapter 11. Say, well, I don't know. I mean, do people really doubt God that much? Well, I don't know. It says in 2 Peter 3 that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fall asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And just like Sodom and Gomorrah, we're getting away with it. God doesn't see. God doesn't care. Christians today think the same thing. Oh, I know the Sodomites are out, but it doesn't seem like God really cares. It's been going on for a long time. Things are going to get worse, but you know what? That's all right. They, they lack the ability to see far off. Look at okay. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, having not received the promises. They died in faith. They believed the promises, and they died believing them, even though they didn't receive them. But having seen them afar off, why is it they were able to die in faith, having not received the promises? Because they have seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them. I mean, things that they would never partake in, Things that were going to come thousands of years later were able to persuade them in their life to they were, they were willing to labor for God. Go read Hebrews 11. All the hall of faith, all the great exploits and works that these men and women of God did. They did them all, it's saying here, because they didn't, even though they knew they weren't going to receive those promises, they were able to see them afar off. Yeah. And it influenced them and persuaded them to labor for God in their lifetime. And embraced them and confessed <coughs> that they were stranger, strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I mean, that's the attitude you have to have if you're not going to if you're not going to linger in the last days. Amen. If you're going to have to labor, you have to understand that this world is not your home. Right. That you're just passing through. That you're not going to go sit in the gate of Sodom and let souls go to hell and let a whole country be turned into hell. Amen. Yep. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and if truly they've been mindful of that country whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country, that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. That's the same promise that they had back then. That God has prepared for them a city. That there remaineth yet a rest of the people of God. Is the same promise that we have today. And that God was a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's the same promise that we have today. And those that linger. Those that refuse to labor in the last days. Are those who doubt these promises. They can't see them afar off. They don't believe them. They're not persuaded. <clears throat> Go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's not be like them. Thank God for the two, almost 3,000 people that are out souling this. Amen. Thank God for everyone that they're not like all the other ones that just, you know, the people that go soul winning on a regular basis, whether it was yesterday or any other day, they go out there, they understand the need to go out and win souls to Christ in these last days. Yeah. Thank God for every one of them. Amen. Let's be like, let's, let's do more of that. Let's have more of that. Let's not Amen. stop doing that. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith, it says in verse 23, without wavering, for he is faithful, that promise. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of our souls together. You know, we don't need any more lots in this, in this world. we got plenty of them. You know, in, in, the, in the world of Christendom, 
In Christianity today, we're filled to the brim with a bunch of lingering lots. We just want to hang out in the gate of Sodom and just enjoy the world as it passes by and just, and just gleefully go along with the world and this culture and this godless society that we're living in. We don't need any more of them. We got all we need. You know, we don't need them lingering and helping to usher in, you know, the wrath of God. I mean, what was Lot doing there? Do you think he was evangelizing? No. Do you think he was out there trying to, you know, win them to Christ, turn them to righteousness? Not at all. <clears throat> In fact, he was a really bad testimony. If anything, if they found out, oh, wait, you're, you're Abraham's? You're, you're a people of God? The Lord God, Jehovah's your God? The God who teaches what we're doing is everything is wrong? He's a bad testimony. Right. And what he's doing is he's helping usher in the wrath of God. Because people look at that, the world looks at that, and they say, well, this must not be real. This must not be true. I mean, this guy claims to believe it. He certainly doesn't live like it. Yeah. So they don't get saved. Yeah. They keep going on their merry way. They get more and more evil, more and more wicked. Yeah. And, and the lots that are lingering in the world market down are helping to usher in God's wrath in this country. Right. Right. What we need are some Abrahams. That's what we need. Who are willing to labor. Who desire mercy on others. Who want to see more righteous who want God, want God to be merciful and, and to see the righteous spared. And even more of them, more Abrahams who desire mercy and have faith and patience to wait for the rest that comes. They, want, they have the faith, they have the, the, the eyes that can see it far off and understand the promises that are made to us, the rest that has come, and in the meantime are going to go out and not linger, but they're going to go out and they're going to labor in these last days. Let's go ahead and pray.